Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. An exchange of fire between Israel and the Islamist organizations in Gaza, which escalated earlier this month, has abated to a large extent. Nevertheless, the status of relations between Israel and Hamas, which rules the Gaza Strip with regard to a more sustainable ceasefire, remains unclear. To further discuss the latest developments, I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Hillel Frisch, who is a senior researcher at Bessa Center at bar -Ilan University. Welcome. Hi. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Ms. Paula Slear, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the latest developments pertaining to this topic. So indeed, some two weeks ago, uh, around uh, August the 8th, Israel and Hamas were on the verge of uh, an intense campaign um, bordering on a war, but uh, both uh, sides thought better of it. And uh, the exchange uh, of fire has to a large extent ceased. But whether this consists a ceasefire, which will then lead to an armistice or even uh, longer, um, are they taking their relationship to a higher level? That remains to be seen, and there are other actors at play, the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, Qatar, the United Nations, perhaps the United States, which sent its national security advisor, John Bolton, to Israel to talk about several issues. So as we are speaking now, it is not yet clear whether the Israeli cabinet is ready to agree to uh, a ceasefire in its uh, broader uh, meaning, and whether the Israeli public is going to support it, and on the other side of the fence, whether Hamas can marshal support for a bigger deal. Faisal Frisch? I, 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 there has never been a cease, an effective ceasefire since um, Hamas has ruled Gaza since 2007. Um, basically, it always came to the next round, and when and in proportion to the hurt that Israel administered to, to Hamas, you had proportionate peace for some time. And the longest peace took place after the longest bout, which was the third bout. So I, I don't think that there are cease, ceasefire agreements. What the Americans, Egyptians, and Israelis are trying to buy is a temporary peace up to November when the sanctions Again, when the oil sanctions against Iran um, take place, because um, all of those forces want the focus solely on Iran, and they're afraid that a flare-up in Gaza will mm -hmm. move the focus to Gaza rather than to Iran. Ms. Lear? Well, there's a general sense that neither Israel nor Hamas wants the situation to escalate any further than it has to. But following on from what was said here, there's a lot of misinformation and lack of information is maybe more correct in terms of what's coming out of the talks that are being mediated by Cairo. There is some talk about a mini truce, which is what we have now. Then there's talk about some kind of longer ceasefire that I've seen reports could be anything from four years to 10 years. Again, no one really knows what's being said behind closed doors. The situation at the moment is to try and bring the recent flare-up in violence back to the situation it was before March the 30th, when we saw this great march of return, which was prompted by these protests along the Israeli-Palestinian border. The question marks, however, are, for example, you have Hamas saying that people will continue to protest, they'll continue with the arson, kites and balloons. You have Israel saying, no way, that has to be part and parcel of a ceasefire. And Hamas insisting that Israel cannot continue to bombard and attack its installments. Israel saying, well, it certainly will continue to do that if it feels under threat. So that's why I say more questions and answers and a lack of information in terms of what is actually being agreed to behind the scenes. Mr. Owen, last week we had uh, somewhat of a decisive decision by Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman when he decided to ease restrictions on uh, the Gaza Strip by means of opening the border crossing to more goods entering the Palestinian enclave as well as uh, making the, the fishing areas where uh, Gaza and Palestinians are allowed to fish uh, uh, a lot bigger, some nine nautical miles, uh, miles, if I'm not mistaken. To what degree did that actually affect uh, the uh, discussions with the Egyptians on both uh, sides? And uh, what happened when we reached Friday and the weekend and uh, uh, the last several days where there was somewhat of a flare up and again, protests and other elements? These are important but interim details. For instance, the fishing zone uh, to which you referred uh, were to go from 6 miles to 12 miles, uh, 
if Hamas ceased all hostilities. So uh, as a temporary measure, it went from six to nine, and it remains to be seen whether Israel will enlarge it uh, further. But uh, even before one goes deeper into the details, there is a framework. And the framework, as um, at least uh, Education Minister Naftali Bennett and other opponents of uh, this uh, agreement uh, are putting it, is that Israel has given up has now, um, rather than fight Hamas, has been the victim of extortion, has um, quitted its fight, and by doing that, not only uh, has Benjamin Netanyahu um, gone against his own promise of never um, uh, acquiesce to terror, but also punished the Palestinian Authority, whose leader, Mahmoud Abbas, as distinct from his predecessor, Yasser Arafat, has forsaken the road of violence and terror and has publicly called for a diplomatic fight with Israel, but no violence. So what uh, the opponents of this agreement are saying is, look what you have done. Uh, rather than go with the more moderate wing of the Palestinian community in the Palestinian Authority, you have relegated them to the margins and at the same time, you are negotiating with your arch enemy, Hamas. Then come the details. But the Israeli public, according to public opinion polls, which were released uh, a few days ago, seems uh, to back uh, Bennett over Netanyahu and Lieberman on this issue. Fazal Frisch. Uh, I, I, I don't think that Bennett um, really wants to make peace with the Palestinian Authority either. I think there is a common denominator between the Likud leaders and Bennett to keep the Palestinians divided between Pal the Palestinian Authority and um, Hamas uh, and to avoid turning the IDF into a means of uniting the, um, Palestin the Palestinians. Uh, I don't think the ceasefire is going to hold because the real item on the agenda is another prisoner deal of the type that occurred in 2011, the release of at least 1,000 major um, terrorists, which Hamas is demanding and is, is increasingly being pressured from below to make that kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be very, very difficult um, for Netanyahu in an, an election year to risk that kind of prisoner deal. Ms. Lear? I've, in the last weeks, covered a lot of stories from Gaza inside and talking to people there. And the general mood in Gaza is a lot of disillusionment. You talk about that you don't think the ceasefire is going to work. The Gazans feel that they're pawns in a game. And when you talk about Abu Mazen, the Palestinian president, being left out of the, the whole political game, the reality is that it's Hamas who caused the shots in Gaza right. and not Abu Mazen. So they, as much as he can throw his, his toys out of the cot and say that he is insisting on being part of the talks, he's not part of the talks, the reality is that he doesn't actually have something concrete to offer. Now, talking to Palestinians in Gaza, it's interesting, a lot of them are concerned that what's happening behind the scenes is a lot of playing into Trump's what they call peace deal of the century, that no one really has real information of what's going on. But there is leaked information about the proposal that potentially Gaza will be the future Palestinian state and the West Bank will be put aside. And here, the concern I'm hearing from Palestinians in Gaza is that Abu Mazen, by threatening that, well, if you leave Fatah and the Palestinian Authority out of this and you insist that the Gaza is going to be separate to the West Bank, well, I'm going to walk away and you're only going to have one, one Palestinian state State, which is going to be Gaza, they're concerned that he's feeding into what Trump might be planning behind the scenes, which feeds into what Israel might be planning. That is the perspective from the Palestinian side. But I think it's worth putting on the table that they feel that they are pawns. They feel desperate. They feel completely hopeless about the ceasefire. And again, they feel that it doesn't really matter what, what gets decided. They will be the ones who will be the losers in the bigger picture. If I may expand on what Please. Paula just said. Uh, Abu Mazen does have one important card, or at least uh, thought he has one, and this is money. He has uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, keep the uh, salaries which uh, the officials, uh, his own uh, ministries, officials from Fatah and others were getting in Gaza. And he has uh, imposed sanctions on Gaza because of his feud with Hamas. Now come the mediators, and the mediators are both Egypt and the UN envoy Nikolai Meladenov, and they are bypassing 
uh, Abu Mazen, they are saying, listen, you can keep your money. We have a new benefactor, Qatar, in the Persian Gulf. Qatar will give us the money for the salaries. So uh, Abu Mazen uh, is frustrated. And if he's too frustrated, and if his own security organizations stop collaborating with the Israeli Shin Bet security agency, we may see terror acts in the West Bank, because right now all eyes are on Gaza and on the question of whether there will be new uh, rocket launching, new balloons and uh, the like. And uh, the West Bank is seemingly quiet, but this is an illusion. This uh, could change overnight. Professor Frisch. Uh, I, I, I think that the Palestinians are always pawns. <laughs> I mean, the people who control um, Gaza are, is Hamas, and Hamas operates to achieve um, Hamas interests. The problem that Hamas faces is that they know that by becoming more independent and becoming, and basically being a state, they're playing into the hands of the Israelis um, who want to divide the Palestinians, because as long as they're divided, there's no um, even hope in heaven for, uh, for a, a comprehensive um, settlement. Regarding um, Abbas, he's very, very weak, and I don't think that he can um, bring about an increase in terrorism. Israel is, has very effectively penetrated um, and penetrates every day with preventive daily arre arrests. And you can see that by the arms that the Palestinians, that the terrorists have. They have, they don't have real arms. They have these toy arms that they make in makeshift, um, you know, workshops. And these are very, very, um, and, and even Hamas um, agrees that Israel has, def has totally destroyed almost any, any of the infrastructures um, of Hamas and certainly of um, Fatah even 10 years ago. So I don't think that he has much going for him. Ms. Lear? If I can just pick up on what Amir said about Qatar getting involved. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why it's so interesting looking at what's happening in Gaza. It is a microcosm of the bigger Middle East and the, the, the powers that are at play. You have Qatar mm -hmm. stepping in over here. Now you have Egypt, which is mediating. Egypt doesn't love Qatar, but at the same time, it has to face up to political reality and say, well, hang on, we do want to find a way that your tens of thousands of, of employees in Gaza will get saved and with the bus saying that he won't send the money, Qatar needs to come to the fore. You have the traditional backers in terms of Hamas being Iran and Turkey. They both are facing their own economic problems, so they're not able to give that kind of economic support to, to Hamas. And you have Iran, for example, who would love to see the, the, the ceasefire not happen. They would love to see more tensions with Israel. So behind the scenes, you do have a lot of this interplay. Of course, Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. Egypt is against the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's interesting how in the Middle East, you know, people find ways of working together, even though they are diametrically opposed to each other. And I think it's interesting what's going on behind the scenes as well. Ms. Lear touched base on something very interesting here with regard to the position of Hamas in uh, the regional uh, political dynamic. Uh, when we're talking about its main backer, obviously, when Egypt was under President Mohamed Morsi, which uh, headed the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Hamas was situated in a much more comfortable and powerful position vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But now that uh, there was the coup and, and Abdel Fattah al-Sisi rose to power uh, a couple of years ago, we have, of course, Turkey, which is also the AKE party, uh, which has a, a significant representation of the Muslim Brotherhood, including President Erdogan, who has uh, some affiliations to this uh, world organization. To what degree does Turkey actually have a say in Hamas uh, domestic and uh, international affairs vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Egypt, which uh, seems like it's uh, also being somewhat controlled by American demands. Turkey does have uh, uh, some say, and uh, it goes to intra-Hamas politics. Uh, the deputy leader of Hamas overall, not Hamas in Gaza, Salah Haruri, used uh, to uh, live in Turkey. Uh, and um, during the uh, short period of rapprochement between Israel and Turkey, uh, he was expelled from Turkey, and now he's uh, mostly in Lebanon or in Syria. Uh, recently, he was let into Gaza in order to participate in the councils of war because he was thought to have a moderating uh, influence. Um, and uh, Turkey 
is a case in point because what you mentioned regarding Muhammad Mursi, which was the heyday of the Muslim Brotherhood movement around the Middle East, was the only time when the Israel Hamas campaign did not include ground maneuver. It was called Pillar of Defense in 2012. And uh, while in 2009 and 2014, you had the Israeli ground forces penetrate Gaza. Uh, in, 12, in 2012, when Morsi was in power, all you had was attacks from, from the air because Morsi could moderate Hamas. Now, of course, Sisi is in power. Sisi has a very good relationship with Israel. Only the other day, the U.S. Defense Secretary, uh, Jim Mattis, said that Israel and Egypt have been collaborating against the Daesh uh, group in the Sinai, Wilayat uh, Sinai. And um, because Israel and Egypt uh, have such a good relationship, obviously Egypt and Hamas do not, and Turkey is powerless. But let me just add one thing regarding the Hamas uh, politics. Yahya Sinwar, the current head of Hamas in Gaza, was released in that Gilad Shalit deal seven years ago. He feels obligated to his former mates in prison. He has vowed to let them out too. Up to now, he hasn't managed to. So he came up with this proposed deal by which he insists on Israel paying and the coin of the round is, again, prisoners, Israel paying for information on the status of the two soldiers. Now, the two soldiers were killed. They were buried in full military ceremonies. But there are remains. Uh, Sinwar says, I'm not going to tell you whether these soldiers are even dead or alive. Israel comes back and says, we don't need this information. We know they are dead. And Sinwar says, no. First release some prisoners, and then I will tell you about the status, and then we will go on to the, to the real deal. They played the same game with Shalit. Now, now um, one has to understand the Israeli state of mind. Up until the early 1970s, Israelis were basically indifferent to uh, prisoners and even POWs. They could have stayed in Arab prisons for a long time. But during the Yom Kippur War of 1973, so many Israelis, especially in Egypt, but also in Syria, became prisoners of war. And the Arab leaders kept their identity and the status secret so that Israel had to go back on the ground in the Kunetra region in the um, agreement with Syria just to get the list and find out what happened to them. All the other Arab organizations learned from it. And now they are, first of all, trying to get some concession for information and then concessions for bodies, not even for, for live Israelis. So this makes uh, any deal much more difficult. Professor Frisch, I would say that we're all talking about a very complicated situation and the ch probability of very complicated situations um, ending in a, in a very clear um, agreement is very, very um, small. Uh, I'll just point to one further complication. I mean, Hamas and Egypt are deadly enemies, deadly enemies. Um, Sisi abducted four of the finest fighters um, two years ago en route to training in Iran and never never um, um, acknowledged abducting them, though Hamas people saw them because this abduction took place around a half a kilometer away from the border. Then a year later, it released these very harrowing, harrowing pictures of these four abducted who are Hamas's finest, um, the best of the, the cream of the, cr the crop, and, and um, uh, of course didn't acknowledge that they disseminated the photographs. And, and, of course, Hamas officials only meet with the Minister of Security, not on, not on a diplomatic level. So there's a lot of hatred, hatred. To speak about the Egyptians as being the mediators is a very complicated um, aspect in, in, in itself. But so nevertheless, the, the, the Gazans are dependent. Yes, are dependent. And this brings me to Turkey versus versus um, Egypt. I mean, the Hamas would love to think that um, Erdogan is going to recreate the Ottoman Empire and somehow create um, a sub-base in Gaza. Uh, 
but it's the Egyptians that control the lifeline of Gaza to the Arab world. I, I mean, you talk about the hatred between Hamas and the Gazans, but there, there has... Hamas and Egypt. Sorry, Hamas and Egypt. But there has been a reduction of Islamic State in the Sinai Peninsula, and that does in some way lend to cooperation between the sides. I mean, when one asks the question, why is Egypt working as a mediator? It's, it's simply because it does owe something to Hamas. It's in its interest that Hamas is quiet and Gaza is quiet. But Egypt also has its own... It, it, it can benefit from a deal on a purely economic basis. There's all these proposals of projects on the line. There's one proposal of having some kind of avenue between Gaza and Cyprus that the Israelis will control from a security point of view. But who builds those projects? It will be the Egyptians that will be building all these projects. When I speak to Palestinians in Gaza, they say, you know, people talk about a ceasefire moving forward, but actually the, the plight of the Palestinians has gone backwards. They're talking about reopening an airport that was always in Gaza. But who gets to who gets to rebuild that airport is the Egyptians. So the Egyptians are mediating. Maybe they're in the best position to do so. They also want to earn brownie points with the Americans. Yes, they have a good relationship with Israel, but they also stand to benefit from this mediation. Mm. It's diabolical and dialectical because Hamas used to be the opposition to Fatah. But having uh, taken over first in elections in 2006, and then a year later, as Hillel mentioned, uh, by armed force, in Gaza, they have become the establishment. And this also has to do with the religious undertones. For Daesh, for the Islamic State, the Islamist Hamas is not Islamist enough. They are infidels. So Hamas finds itself as the opponent of Daesh, uh, even though uh, uh, from the outside it looks as if they were supposed to be natural allies. No, they are not, Hamas is not extreme enough uh, mm -hmm. for Daesh. Let us not forget that uh, the Ottoman Empire actually conquered Israel, Jerusalem, uh, and uh, the entire region from the Egyptians at the time, uh, back in the 14th, 15th century. But uh, on the point of Turkey, uh, Professor Fish, when we're talking about uh, the current strain between uh, the United States and Turkey, will Turkey try to uh, use its leverage on Hamas to somehow challenge the American aspiration to bring about some kind of a long-term ceasefire? I don't think it has that kind of leverage. It's, 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 simply, um, it's simply proved false um, during the um, Marmara incident, mm -hmm. um, where there was hope, Palestine, Hamas hope, that, that Turkey would become a major player. And they just can't be, because they simply are too far away, don't have control. And, and um, Hamas knows this, and it's going to take its own interests. And I, I don't think, I don't think um, it'll play ball with Turkey just to improve Turkey's position. Would you agree with that, yes, Mr. Olin? Yeah. Yes, Turkey, Turkey doesn't have a, a lot of leverage. And uh, the real fight is within Hamas, where you have uh, three centers of power, two in Gaza, the so-called political wing and the military wing, and the um, outside uh, Gaza, Hamas uh, leadership of uh, Khaled Marshal and Salah uh, Aruri. And um, basically what you heard a few days ago from Ismail Ania, who is uh, part of the leadership uh, in Gaza, is that Hamas will not give up its arms or its principles, which means that Israel will probably let Hamas keep what it has. It won't let it get more, but it will not insist on reducing its arsenal. And Hamas will keep saying that the uh, principle is resistance is there to stay. But whether it will actually do anything to realize this principle is something else. And therein lies the basis for the uh, longer term ceasefire. Mr. I, I agree that the chances of a ceasefire working between Israel and Hamas are questionable, but I do think that it is not in either side's interest to have the current status continue or, or, or get worse. I think for Hamas, they are tired. I think they understand that if Israel had to go to war with them, they have a lot to lose particularly their grip on, on, on Gaza. Also, they would lose more people. Um, it's, it's not in their interest, essentially, to go to war with Israel. From the Israeli side, they don't want to see soldiers dead. They don't want to be potentially on two fronts. Israel's got a lot to worry about what's happening on her northern border, mm -hmm. particularly vis-a-vis -vis Syria and Iran and what's happening there. And also, it's, it's, the, it's the holiday season here in Israel. They don't want to see tourists run away from Israel. They need the influx um, into the economy. It's, it's Jewish holidays. So despite the mediation and the question marks of whether or not 
the ceasefire will work, I think underlying all of it is the fact that neither side wants to see a flare-up in tensions. We uh, earlier said about uh, the Palestinian Authority being subsided with regard to its uh, ability to somehow influence the Gaza Strip with its financial backers. But Qatar is obviously also under still sanctions from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and uh, other members of the uh, Saudi coalition. To what degree will they alleviate that blockade on uh, Qatar in order to allow for such a ceasefire to emerge? Uh, this is questionable because the um, uh, feud between uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia and uh, leaders of Qatar is personal, it's ego-driven, and not even uh, uh, President Trump has managed uh, to placate uh, the uh, bad blood between them. But um, eventually, what one hopes is that the fine print will, will decide it. And by fine print, I mean that once prisoners are released, and there will be hundreds of Hamas prisoners released from Israeli uh, prisons, the terms of the release will impose on them uh, going somewhere else rather than Gaza. Or... Uh, committing to uh, stay out of terror so that the Israeli authorities will be able to market this concession by saying, hey, we are now saving the upkeep of these prisoners in our prisoners. It's in our benefit. Let's get rid of them. Or some other marketing uh, ideas mm -hmm. which Netanyahu and Lieberman are masters at. Well, uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so uh, Professor Frisch, we have enough time for one closing sentence. My long-term strategic uh, assessment is that there will be a fourth round, mm -hmm. and that fourth round will be very much like the similar Israeli-Arab state rounds, and it will bring Hamas basically um, to accept Israel as, as much as they hate them. Ms. I think it also depends what happens on the ground. Here I'm talking particularly about the protests that happen every week. We see them dwindling. Hamas is not calling people to go for the protests, but it can't suddenly say to people, don't protest when it was behind them all along. So mm. it's also going to be a bit of a sell for Hamas in terms of how it, what it brings to the Palestinian people in Gaza vis-a-vis -vis the ceasefire and why it wants them to support it. Mr. Owen? The Israeli military uh, has managed um, a policy of brinkmanship, but also has warned the Israeli political leadership not to go over the brink. Up to now, it has been successful. It doesn't want a fourth round. Well, this is all the time that we've, uh, we have for today. I'd like to thank Professor Frisch, Mr. Owen, and Ms. Lear for being here today. And I'd like to thank your viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.